in praise of African God, in the tradition of our ancestors, and in celebration of our history. The First World Alliance invites you to share in our opening ritual, to honor our elders with those Africans over 60 years of age. Please stand. to honor our children, those who are among us and those who have left us. With the youngest African child in the house, please stand or be held up. Oh no, all right, all right, all right. To honor African life for those sisters who are carrying a child in their womb. Please stand. All right. Hello. Brothers and sisters of the First World family, we thank you. And when I call for the sisters to stand, I want to see more than one sister. That's right. <laughs> Because we are building a nation. And the only way to build a nation is to produce the, the little ones to make a nation. So they are our future. They are our future. Um, Dr. Ben is going to be our speaker today. And I call his name because he's busy talking over here. <laughs> and that is the reason why I call his name first. Uh, Doc has been running all over the country because, of course, you know, this has been Black History Month, and some of us only take one month out of the year to really discuss what we have accomplished or what we have not accomplished or what our ancestors have done. Uh, we here, the First World Family, we do it annually, all year round. Since we are the first people to walk on this planet, our history dates back before anyone else, so it takes years and years and years to discuss our history, because our history is the real history. Today, Dr. Ben is going to come before us and speak on African philosophy. Dr. Ben? It's certainly good to uh, be back, so to speak. I think I want to dedicate my lecture to my elder. He's always been saying, well, we are along the same age, Ben. And then an unfortunate situation took place. And at the foot of the bed, they had to put his age, you see. So, <laughs> so while his mouth was going a mile a minute, I was looking there and said, damn, John older than I am. <laughs> so John is the oldest of the elders, so I'll dedicate this lecture to John and hope that his wife don't beat him again and then he tell us that he had a stroke. <laughs> but his son told me he, he did have a stroke, that she didn't beat him this time. Uh, it was the other time. <laughs> the subject of African philosophy I found to be more important, particularly this month in my travels again throughout the United States. Unfortunately, including today, I have 
the entire month of February, I have not seen a day when I was not in the airplane, including this morning. Of course, uh, I wouldn't be in the airplane tomorrow, and, but I'll be back in it Monday. And everywhere I went, I found that young people, the young black people, do not have any philosophy at all, much less a black philosophy. In examining the available materials which black, young black people could have possibly secured some concept of a black philosophy, and I wish to call it at this point an African philosophy, and I will not again call it a black philosophy. I looked at the available material why this is so. First of all, I found that there is no such thing as an African or even black philosophy in church. There's no black Christianity. There's no black philosophy which a black minister espoused when thus but the vast majority of African people are either in the church, the synagogue, or the mosque. There is no black, and that's the way they do it, philosophy in the mosque either. It is an Asian philosophy that they are expounding. I look at John Beattie's John Beatty, book in order to find and see if it would be there see if John M. Beatty had placed a, an African philosophy in there. And what I found is that he's trying to take certain aspects of African philosophy to justify his own Christianity. I thought I went and looked into Washington's, uh, I forget uh, Washington's first name, and his uh, black church to see if in fact in that black church he was going to present us an African philosophy that the black church espouses and found none there. I then decided to look at Janis John's Muntu. I am now looking at a European to see if that European, by coincidence, ran into an African philosophical concept and had placed it into his book and found none there. I also look at Godfrey Parinder's African uh, philosophy and see if in fact he caught it and he did not catch it no more so than one of the earlier of the white men who attempted to say that he had in fact seen something in African philosophy and that's a book called Bantu Philosophy by a Roman Catholic priest who maintained that the Africans do not have a philosophical concept about God that the concept about God is axiomatic and accidental. That the African, when he speaks in terms of a God, in any manner at all, it is not one that has been intellectually conceived, but one that is from the ordinary, what you would call in it, expression of fear. And I went on even to look at one man whom I quote a lot, to see if in fact he captured the philosophical concept, why he was writing in the manner which he wrote about the African, that gods, all the gods and goddesses came out of an African concept. And that was Godfrey Higgins, who wrote Anacalypsis. And I looked down in that and found that the only thing Godfrey Higgins espoused in the book is the origin of the gods and goddesses of ancient time, having come from Africa, but not what the philosophical and theosophical concepts of those gods were. I look at Albert Churchward's origin, the origin and the evolution and origin of Christianity, or oh, his other books, The Origin and Evolution of Religion, and thought that I could find it there. And again, it was absent. So I had to now find out if I look in what is called traditional African religion by African writers, would I find a definitive explanation of African philosophy. And I look in Olabjo's work. It's called um, African Traditional Religions. The title itself should have let me know that I would find no philosophy there. Because why would an African speak of African traditional religion? All religions are traditional. 
And it, is, it came from the myth that the African religion is traditional. What they mean by that is like the word primitive. That it is just something that Africans did for time immemorial, and so I'm writing it down, but not something that the Africans philosophically thought of. And so it is, let me try or let me attempt to deal with a broad concept of African philosophical thoughts, African philosophical thoughts not only along the Nile, but throughout the entire continent of Africa, and not only the continent, but the islands related to Africa, and still beyond that, as the Africans branched out and found themselves in other countries, other lands, hostile or not. By that I mean, Africans who are now, let's say, in the Caribbean or Haiti, I mean, or Brazil, or even Africans here in the United States, because Africans in the United States develop a religiosity. Even in the Christian religion, the African church is a totally different church when you go to an African church. I mean, there are a lot of churches in the United States now with Africans, from the minister to the congregation, to everybody else in the neighborhood, they are Africans, but the church isn't. And then the bodies are African. The people in there are African. But when they have a Jesus like that, you know that the church isn't African. You don't, you don't, you don't need to be discussing the issue. Because if the Jesus looked like that, and the congregation looked like this, and the minister looked like this, and that is there, you know it can't be African with those people keeping quiet. So, uh, the mere fact that we have that church. Now, the African church, primarily, using the word church to mean a house of religiosity, a place where people assemble. It doesn't have to be four walls. It could be in the middle of the street. It could be up on top of a mountaintop or in a cave. And using church as the collective body rather than a building. The Africans first started out in his or her religiosity, and I'm going to say his for this specific reason. Every way I've gone and every religion I've studied, the African made religion for the man. He did not make religion for the woman because he knew that the African woman didn't need religion. God doesn't need a religion. So why make a religion for God? I hope you understand that one. <laughs> Unlike Judeo-Christianity and Islam, where the woman is being punished for getting, giving birth to a child, or even before giving birth to a child, for having the intelligence to know that she is supposed to have sexual intercourse. You see, in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, the, the guy who wrote it made a dumb woman and a dumber man. It got to be the dumber man because at least in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, the woman got, had her senses together and realized she was wasting time. And thus got up and saw a snake coming down a tree, or a reptile. <laughs> and since the reptile laying next to her wasn't doing a damn thing, <laughs> she went to give the reptile laying next to her, what the, the person connected to the reptile, some sort of instruction, shall we say, a demonstration <laughs> of good things to come. <laughs> and so it is that the African, the male, whether we find him in the Dogon religion of West Africa, the religion of the worship of Olodumare or Olorum, the Yoruba religion, or we see him in the southernmost part of Africa, Monomotapa, the god Unkulunkulu, or we see him in the eastern part of Africa, God Ngai, among, but let me just back up a little and explain the kind of people who were involved with these God concepts, by the way. In the God Vudum, we have the religion of Voodoo, and we are talking about what is called French West Africa, primarily Dan and Homi, which the French call Dahomey. In the religion of the worship of Unkulunkulu, we are talking about the so-called 
Um, Zulu, Zulu is not plural. It's no S there. It's, it's, uh, Zulu is woman. I'm a Zulu, more than one. And we are talking about the god Ngai, and thus we're talking about the Agikuyu. Kikuyu one, Agikuyu more than one, not Kikuyu with an S. And of course, along the Nile, we are talking about Ptah and the worship of God Ptah. That religion was not given a specific name. It was, the, the religion was named in honor of the God which you worship. If you were worshiping Ptah, then no one said it was the whatever religion, it was just the worship of Ptah. Because men had not established the concept of religion. Men had established the concept of theosophical thoughts, and that's why neither of the gods were stated in terms of religion. It was in terms of the worship of the particular god, and the African allowed each other the distinct thought and the ability to be different. The man and his wife could have had two separate gods of worship, and the child then would worship both of the gods since the child inherited the concept of both gods, one from the mother and one from the father. And since Africans had no god higher than the other one, it was no difficulty, since it is the concept of God is a concept that is common, it is in high, it is in low. Of course, not in the West. And it's so. But then men, I look all over Africa, why is it that the Africans still, for the most part, maintain a matriarchal society, we inherit in every place in Africa primarily from our mother, not from our father, because the Africans philosophically, from basic observation, understood the reality that the woman must be the one to inherit from. We inherited the life itself from the woman. We came from the woman. We were attached to the woman. And the African looking at that reality a child is attached to its mother from the time of conception. The concept, the state of attachment increases as the life within or the growth within. I'm not going to argue the polemics of uh, whether or not a child is a human being when it's incepted or it's six months, five months. That's uh, calisthenics I'm not going through. But let us say, at whatever time you feel that the child, that sperm, has now incubated long enough to become a child, a feast, whatever it is, then that is the time acceptable to yourself. But there is a time, no one will deny, when there is an attachment between child and mother by virtue of what is called the umbilical cord. The African observing this, this reality, it is not an hypothesis on the part of the African. It is a reality. No one can deny this reality. And thus the Africans, in his wiseness, in their wiseness, the writers, because God has never written a thing. Nowhere has a God written anything in any language. Nowhere has a God spoken. Man wrote down what he believed. God or the goddess said, or desire to say. God speaks what the writer wants God to say. And it is no different. We do it all the time. There is a dead person and we say, we're going to put on this suit on him. He would have liked this suit. We're going to put on this dress. She would have liked it. She's going to hate the damn dress or the thing. The point is this, that the person might have liked the dress up to the day they died. And just that morning before the death, I said, you know, I didn't like that dress, cook, and they're gone. <laughs> but, but who's going to ask the dead person if they like the dress or the, or the suit before they put it on? Because then they're going to take you to the insane asylum if you do. Some of you do more than that. You keep the dead people three or four days, go a bit right back there every day in agony, crying, messing up the insurance money. Get rid of the body as soon as it dies. You save yourself some money. At least your boyfriend can enjoy it. But let's go ahead. That is one of the reasons we'll come to that why Africans bury their dead the same day when you die. But we see from the philosophical concept what we are observing in all of the cases before we come to the concept of what is called religion, 
And religion is the deification of a culture. Let me explain what I mean by that. You have a culture. You have a group of people come together. That group of people comes to an extent to which it is now called a tribe. From a family, a group of families, to what is now called a tribe. A tribe to a nation. But let us say we bring it back to the point of the group of families to the extent of a tribe. There are too many of the family in one area, and they must move away to give each other some breathing space. And thus, the big village becomes the tribe. As it becomes that tribe, there is need for regulations. There's no longer the possibility of saying, Mama heads this or Daddy heads this, and we listen to what Mama says. It is too large, and so it is now necessary for elders, people within that group, in that, that group, that village, to be established as the leaders, people who are going to pay most of the te- attention, if not all, towards the cultural maintenance of that group, going to establish the moral concepts of that group, the moral concept, how we're going to behave, what we're going to consider the most valuable, the sacred things. That's the word sacred is now going to creep in here. To be sacred is the epitome of being moral. To be moral is to follow the rules established within a particular society. To be religious then is to embrace the culture, to embrace the subdivisions of the culture, such as the morals and so forth. And now, to be religious is to hold those values sacred even unto your life. Meaning that you will be, you will be, give up your life if called upon by virtue of the society to the extent that the Africans, some African society says that if the man and the woman do a certain thing, it will even spoil the crops. The vegetables will go bad. The animals will get sick. Now somebody said that isn't logical. When religion isn't logical, it isn't intended to be logical. Uh, religion is the sacredness of a culture, not the sacredness of something logical. Whatever the culture established as its basis for existence, its basis as a moral code, that becomes sacred. And that sacredness becomes religion. Thus it is, it is impossible for a people to adopt their conqueror's religion and be sacred. It's impossible. The reason that we are having the troubles we have is we have not only adopted the conqueror's religion, but at times our own religion, we have accepted the conqueror's interpretation of our own religion. Uh, Let me give you some examples. How could an African society engulfed in polygamy accept the Adam and Eve story? It's a contradiction. If you are in a polygamous society, and we are right here in the United States, polygamy is not necessarily being married to three women. Polygamy is in its essence living with three women. You don't have to live in the same house. You mating with three women. Even if it's once a week, twice a week, ten times a week, no time a week for some people. Some people just pretend emotion. <laughs> Talk to yourself, John. <laughs> now, we have to understand that. The Adam and Eve story could not have been an African story, particularly a polygamous union. There are other reasons, of course, and it is the concept of the family. The family in African society is the highest form of living. The family. Nothing comes before the family in African tradition. And that is typical in every African society. Even God doesn't transcend the authority of the family and the sacredness of the family. 
Because out of the family, out of one of the people within the culture comes God. And the goddess. Let me repeat that. Within an African society, a person, a male, for whatever the reason of his achievement, considered to be in the in excelsior, considered to be at the highest epitome that anyone can act within the culture, that person become God. No different than in Christianity. Jesus became God not because there's something drop out of the sky, but because Jesus supposed to have done things that other men they had not done. Some people try to say that Jesus becomes God because of Calvary's cross, that he lost some blood. But it's no big deal because there were two other guys nailed up on the same cross, one meaning similar cross, next to each other, who lost blood, and they didn't become God. It must be then something distinctly different why Jesus was said to have become God. And we can only look back and see it's a, a behavior pattern within the culture, and the culture then excelled him to the top position. The same thing we see with Buddha, the same thing we see as Muhammad ibn Abdullah did, as he became proficient by virtue of his own behavior. He is said to be the one to explain who the God is, although he himself did not claim to be the God, the fact that in essence he was the God, because his proclamation made the God. He said there is a God, and the God has this, and everybody accepts what he said, therefore he is the God himself. He is the one that specified the God. So that what we are, we are seeing is that the same thing in the case of Akhenaten. Akhenaten, or Aminotep, the uh, word, could have said that he was the God. But he said there was a God named Atom. But Atom had all the qualities that Akhenaten himself specified in his own philosophical writing. Thus, Atem was in fact and is in fact Akhenaten. But Akhenaten did not want to hold it, the responsibility for being the God, thus he thrusted it on an entity he called Atem. The Africans, however, in understanding the concept of a God, reverted back to the supremacy of the goddess. And out of this supremacy of the goddess, which the African has shown in, some, in most of the significant temples, and I say significant, not that uh, all the temples uh, could be classified, but in this specific um, uh, manner in which I'm using them. Let us take the temple of uh, Setai One and look at that temple and the tombs of various pharaohs in the Valley of Kings. And we would notice that at no time, not a single instant, did the Africans put a man, put a god, to be representative of the heavens. In any temple you go, and the heavens, the heavens, plural, not heaven, one. The Hebrews couldn't understand to use more than one, and so settle with one. If you don't understand a thing, with one, how are you going to add many? It makes make much, uh, much more confusion. So they stop with one heaven. But the Africans in their heavens placed a woman. For those of you who went to Egypt, you saw in whatever temple that they were showing you heaven, it was a woman, and it is a woman, that you see the African place. They not only did the African place a woman there and said, I place a woman, they painted her with stars, with clouds blue, with a firmament, a sky, and they make you understand by putting a God on which she rests. A God, in the case, let us take the supreme case of this, the goddess, uh, look, her body across the ceiling, her head and arms and one wall hanging down, and the opposite wall, her legs hanging down. And on the bottom is the god, Geb, and one knee, and 
down his knee in one and is bent in the other, with both hands spread out in a V, one hand supporting her by the chest, by the mammary gland, the other hand supporting her by the, the pelvic region, the place of birth. And that is the concept of the African man. The African man pronouncing and proclaiming his woman as heaven. It says that God is holding look at the two pillars, the two columns of heaven, the two supports of heaven. Thus, where, what is it that the Africans are saying philosophically is heaven? The reproductive organ and the chamber of life. Where is the chamber of life but the womb? Out of this concept, the Africans brought philosophy. It is in here, right in this particular area of the African thought process, that we find the concept, the basic philosophical concept of life itself. What is philosophy supposed to be dealing with? Philosophy is supposed to transcend the aspects of material. It is supposed to take material and transcend material from the exoterical fabric to the esoterical fabric. Exoterical. E-X-O-T-E-R-I-C-A-L. That which is material and explainable by scientific thought or analysis. Esoterical. E-S-O-T-E-R-I-C-A-L. That which is beyond transcends that which is material and explainable by logical thought. That's the difference. And that is God. The second thing I said is in fact God. That which is not material, but by virtue of intellectual thought, otherwise called knowledge, otherwise called logic, and that gives us the concept of God. But within the concept of God, there is the philosophical order that explains it all. So when we talk about the Greeks given to the world philosophy, and I know that many of you have read Professor George G.M. James, James's work, Stolen Legacy, the myth of the Greeks being the authors, the originators of philosophy in itself, by virtue of the fact that the Greeks are not related to the first society or the first people that men have in record or the oldest known by virtue of fossil finds, those things automatically deny any possibility of the Greeks being authors of philosophy. Anytime a group of people come together, for whatever the reason, the purpose for being together is philosophical. Even if a group of gangsters came together to rob Harlem, they must have developed a basis for coming together, a concept. It's philosophical. Philosophy does not have to be good. Because good and bad, our ancient ancestors tell us, are equal. See, bad and good are equal. You can't have one without the other. In everything that's good, it is equally as bad. Let me give you a demonstration. If you take a match, you can put it to the, the gas coming through your stove, light the stove, and cook your food. And everybody would be more than likely happy to eat the food. <laughs> that is a good or men. But somebody could be eating the food and the food go down the wrong passage and choke the person to death. The same food as a result of the same match. And then you will say, it is bad that he died. But the undertaker is clapping his hand. He's so happy he died. It's a job for the undertaker. If he did not die, the undertaker would go broke if nobody died. So goodness and badness are relative terms. And that's why the Africans developed in order to establish the foundation, something visual, they established what is called the diagram of the law of opposites. 
the law of opposite. Do Africans specify that there is an actual law, an actual law that determines and compels things to act in opposite? We call that today equilibrium. Things of equal force acting on each other keep themselves in equilibrium, keep themselves in unison, keep themselves from the lack of movement. What we are saying to that, let's give it a mother type. Let us give it arithmetic, arithmetic, uh, arithmetical kind of explanation. Anytime you have two things of the same solid, the same weight, we put them against each other, they cannot move. Because one cannot move the other, one doesn't have a greater force than the other. But take two things, one of a greater mass, or of a greater weight than the other, and the one will move the other. And that we see even in water. If you have water, and you put it on top of a hill, then you could build a house on another hill, but the house cannot be higher than the source of the water and the first hill. Otherwise, the water will not reach. Don't care how deep down the water goes. It can go a thousand feet, ten thousand feet down. As long as there's enough water in that source, it's going to come up to that house that is in the same height. Water, it says, will always reach its own level. But if you want it to go to a higher hill, you must now pump that water up because it cannot reach a level beyond its original source. Philosophy. You said, this is a behavioral pattern of man's philosophical thinking. That man's philosophical thinking according to the Africans, and that's everywhere that we go as, we start to, as I start to examine the actual philosophical concept of singular religion, we will see these generalized concepts hold true. It is, by the way, the fundamentals of this concept that gave the justification for the Africans establishing the educational system which we now call the mysteries system. The things I've been speaking about thus far is part of the system we call the mystery system. It is mysterious, isn't it? It is mysterious, yet it is common knowledge. All I'm speaking about, you already knew, but you did not put it into that context because your training was European. And the concepts I'm speaking about are African. And you cannot put a European thought process in terms of deity, that which it encompasses all. It is impossible for a European to see me go to a tree and then say to the tree, Three, I am sorry, I have to cut a branch off of you. You know, uh, many days I pass by here and it's raining and you kept the rain from falling on me. Uh, three, I, my child came here the other day and swung on you. And just on this little limb here, he swung and enjoyed himself. And now I got to cut you off. I, I'm so sorry. Is there anything I could do for you in the time? Can you, can you give my mind the satisfaction to conceive what I can do. In other words, what is the man saying? Then the, the European will say, that fool is talking to a tree. But sometimes it's better to talk to a tree than a certain human being I know. <laughs> At the least, the tree will answer. The tree will give me the answer I want in my mind. Yes, the tree speaks back. The tree says, well, go ahead. You need it for your house. That's what the tree said, because I said it for the tree. <laughs> Huh? You heard people say, I'm going to talk to God. I'm going to deliberate on this point. And so they go right in the back, kneel down and do all kind of things, and then come back and say, I got it. God has just given me the answer. And you say, how could God give him the answer? Quite easy. He's God. And he went to God. It's just like the man who loves to speak to an intelligent man. And like to hear an intelligent man speak. And always listen to an intelligent man. So he speaks to himself. <laughs> because all religion based upon that. The authors, the scribes, spoke to God. Or the goddess. 
originally, and in turn received the answers from the goddess. So that when in the Christian religion they say that Saul of Tarsus was on the road to Damascus and saw and spoke with Jesus, some of you think it's a big deal. I've been talking to my God many times. Not even on, not on the road to Damascus, but on the road to 116th Street. <laughs> and I said to my God the other day, look, I don't want to go home right now. What do you think I should do? And God said, don't go home. <laughs> so I didn't go home. <laughs> because God speaks to me in here. On my mind. The difference is that God don't speak to you because you speak to God with your heart. I don't speak to God with my heart. My heart pumps blood. That's the only function it got. My mind speaks to God. And my mind speaks to my goddess. I don't think she's here yet, but uh, she could tell you. She's here? Well, she's back there. <laughs> the other day, my mind said, Cook. <laughs> Right? But the concept then, the philosophical concept that the Africans then engendered from this experience within their culture, gave them the opportunity to be able to extend to the exoterical, to the extent that the African could take a stone, cut that stone in a shape, or a piece of wood. If the African could carve to the tree, and the tree responds sufficiently to the thought process of the African, then the African can equally take the limb of tree, cut it into shape, put it on the ceiling, like in the case where Chinua Achebwe is speaking, and things fall apart. The Choco and the Englishman who cannot understand that this carved God to the African is as symbolic as his Jesus, symbolism of a man or a cross, to the European, but the European can conceive it because he's using somebody else's philosophical and theosophical thought processes to adapt to his own society, and there was no way in which he could see it, and that's why Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul, eventually got killed. He got killed because he was trying to translate an African Asian religiosity to a European, and the Romans could not understand it. Thus it is. The crucifix, the Roman symbol, became the symbol for the African. The African does not use any longer the African enormous, the key of life. The Romans still maintain it. What the Europeans, what the Europeans have done to the ank, A N K H, is to put a face in that ank. But the Europeans have maintained not a man's face. They put a woman's face, and they call it the symbol of fertility. But then what else is God but fertility? What else is God but sex? If you doubt me, how did you get made? Nobody made you out of dirt. At least. I hope my women make out of dirt. I thought I was having something else. With the dirt I was getting? Uh, I thought it was something else, but you know, you can fool me. <laughs> they told me there was a sperm bank, you know what I mean? And there was some over, some eggs, and that the sperm fertilized the egg. But it didn't mean dirt fertilized the dirt. <laughs> so if God was making people out of dirt originally, God gave up that long ago. When God found there was a sweeter way, God realized there's a better way. <laughs> I was reading where even the European God said, let us make men. I don't think they were talking to another man. <laughs> Doesn't work out too well in that way. Even with John Hopkins operation, <laughs> Dr. Anderson is here, he could tell us that that kind of operation uh, don't turn out too many babies. Uh, not too many, don't turn out one. <laughs> he, 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 he says he has never been surprised in the maternity room and seen babies born out of dirt. They generally come out of women, and the process is generally sexual intercourse. Even if it's insemination artificially, you need a male sperm or some sperm, or a billion of them trying to get into the act. But all right, nevertheless. <laughs> the Africans, someone said, but the Africans didn't understand the matter of the interplay of the sperm 
and the over. I said, what makes you feel that the Africans did not understand the interrelationship between the sperm and the ova and the fertilization process? It is just as much as Europeans want to know how the people of Dagon could understand the movement of Sirius, that star bank, because Europeans didn't understand it. Because Europeans did not have a certain type of tools, otherwise called telescope scopes and whatnot, in order to observe this, they then believed that no one else could have a scientific knowledge in order to come up to the same thing that they came up after. It must be. And this is one of the reasons why we have the nonsense about the Africans building these things, the uh, pyramids from the top down. By mind power. Why do you need mind power when mind power is in your hand? Mind power is in mathematics. It is the mind that makes mathematics. It is the mind that makes the body move. The mind, then, is the nucleus of the body. The mind, the mind accentuates the positive as there. The mind forces every action. When the mind ceases to function, the body is going to live dead. And now we are finding that no longer getting a breath test, it is the mind scan to see if you are at least legally dead or, or medically dead. And so the Africans obviously knew. They knew because they came up with that specific understanding. And so we find in the philosophical concept of the law of opposite that the African is saying that everything is related to the other. It wasn't Einstein that developed the concept of relativity. He developed a mathematical figure by which they could use a metal, some sort of material to contain the, 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 act, the action of uh, multiplicity of one item splitting itself into another and yet maintaining itself as a whole. But the Africans had already spoken about the atom. In the Book of the Dead, they have already spoken about the atom, the African knew. For thousands of years before Adam and Eve, before Abraham, before the Old Testament, Book of Genesis, the Africans had already written about the atom. The infinitesimal part of a minuteness. In other words, as one item becomes minute, it also has another particle of its own minuteness. Right. And this chain reaction carries the things to the minimum of its minuteness, and still there is material. That you can't get rid of material. The Africans knew that. That it's impossible for material to become non-material. The African knew that what you could do with material is change its form, but you could not destroy it. It constantly remains, regardless of how it, the chain reaction goes on. And that is what Einstein attempted, and to some extent, did put into mathematical figure. That's what was the uniqueness of Einstein, not that he had developed the concept of the atom. Now, many people will ask again, why and how could the Africans at that early stage? But we assume that the early stage, because it did not have the apparatus, the tools that we use, there could not be any other method by which men intellectually could do things. And that is because when the Europeans came to Egypt, and particularly at the Grand Lodge of Wa'at, Oloxa, they started to destroy, and who knows what they destroyed. When Justinian, the Roman emperor, came, he completed what the, his predecessors, the Greeks, had done. But even before the Greeks, the Persians did it. And before the Persians, the Assyrians, and before the Assyrians, the Hyksos, all came destroying because they could not understand. They could not understand the complexity of the science that the Africans had engaged in. No more could they understand the physical properties the Africans were using. Let us go to the concept of the Immaculate Conception and Virgin Birth. We know that in our concept, in order for a woman to immaculately conceive, in our childish mind, European style, 
She has to have never had a man rupture her hymen. Of course, uh, most, most of us think that um, being virgin is something that is miraculous. It's only mean that a little piece of ultra-sensitive membrane has not been ruptured in a female. And some of us go in saving this as if it's a, uh, well, <laughs> the tooth for the fairy. <laughs> I hate that I have to uh, put the uh, oral explanation with it because you may get misunderstanding. I think I would withdraw the explanation of the, uh, the, the, the tooth for the fairy. Let's call it the tooth for something. I still deal with the oral thing, but all right. I have a, uh, shall I say, a fixation about that. But the hymen, which we now find, could be destroyed without physical contact. I also found that if you wait till you're 80 years old, you may not find anything <laughs> left. Anyhow, so you had better get in that uh, while you could still deal with it. I, I had a, I wouldn't say this because a certain person in the audience will know who I'm talking about, but I, I had someone that I knew and she did not touch at all human body and the human body didn't touch hers, except her own, I understood. And um, she just, have her solace with some gin uh, when the point comes because she said that nobody will touch her, that's men, until she get married. And when she was in her late 60s, she turned out to have cancer of the cervix. It seems as if the cancer had, ate, had eaten everything and it, she still lost it anyhow and without fun. And she could have had, she was going to lose it and lose it too and have some fun out of it, but all right. Uh, she thought it was better to give it to gin, but all right. We have to understand that the concept, the concept of virginity has nothing at all to do with an immaculate conception. The myth that a woman must be nice, she must maintain herself from, as I said, masculine contact in that, in the reproductive area. Of course, we don't uh, limit the man to that same restriction being that he doesn't have a hymen and we give him free run as a rule. But assuming that the man and the woman had no physical contact of that sort which we would call sexual intercourse, it is in our perverted view of sex and life to say that that, the lack of that contact between male and female and by some miraculous thing, a child enters into the woman that that is the immaculate conception. Now that's a European version. It's predominantly Roman Catholic and adopted by most Protestants. But it has nothing to do with fact whether it is esoterical or exoterical. What the Africans were speaking about, obviously, as you see it, more dramatic we described particularly in the temple of Setai One. It is demonstrated in many other places, but more specifically, the drawings and everything, which the Europeans and other early Christians and Muslims and so tried to destroy the evidence. You could go there and see how they took chisels and all and tried to chop it out, right. to destroy the evidence of this, because they wanted to maintain the myth of this physical sexuality. The Africans were speaking of an immaculate conception. We may even say that any mother in this building, and I would may even say, I will say it, that every mother in this building had an immaculate conception. Whether or not she pursued that immaculate conception to a virgin birth of a child is something else. But what is the immaculate conception that we see so much in the Egyptian Book of the Dead that we saw in an entire wall in the Temple of Setai One. And I think they've made it very clear in their own teachings about it. It is stated very clearly and the picture related equally that symbolically, symbolically, 
The God in which they're speaking about is Osiris. They show Osiris lying slightly, slightly on the incline. No more than about five degrees from where his, his uh, column, spinal column meets to the uh, pelvic bone back here, down here to seat the seat. And there it is about a five degree incline. So this, uh, for all good and purpose, is almost perpendicular. Now, but the show of Cyrus in the statement is the risen God. He is the God that died and rose from the dead to now become the God of resurrection. I'm speaking about 40 to 100 years before the story of Jesus. Let me repeat. Osiris, having died, having been in life as a human, having been become God by virtue of his death, he too was cut up, murdered, into 14 pieces, the same as Jesus was stabbed 14 times. Symbolic, isn't it? <laughs> he, after death, arose on the third day after his death. His mother tried to reassemble his body, the 14 pieces. But Isis is equally his mother as well as his wife. The same kind of thing. We're talking about esoterics now. That when we talk about God, God could be any quantity, any time, any amount, at any place. Thus you say, how could it be the mother and father, the mother and sister and wife of, and it's the same person because you're talking about religion. No, you're talking about God and goddess. And anything can happen because the power of the deity is without bounds. But I'm drawing the similarity. And we see now a bird, a hawk, a silence line on the death, giving himself his own resurrection, now insert the sperm of life into the hawk, because it's a hawk that you see hovering over. And the hawk then takes the semen and passes it to Isis, who in turn becomes pregnant and produces God, Horus. We have the same thing the Europeans have adopted at the Nicene Conference. Mary, become pregnant by the angel, a bird, like the hawk, from Jehovah, who is Jesus, as well as Jesus' father, the Trinity. It says, Jesus, God, and Jehovah are one. That's what we They call it, what? Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Today the ghost become a spirit. It's Holy Spirit. Because <laughs> black people are called ghosts, and they don't want us. Black, black people are called spook. And they call us spook, and they don't want us to be God, so you know. The Holy, the Holy Ghost became a spirit. Nobody wants to talk about holy black men. But I'll frighten most of us. We done said nigga in shit. So we can't have a holy one of them. Even with your prayer, give it up. Now, but we see this. We then see Osiris, Horus being born of an, a virgin birth. In. But there's one thing we see in the picture there. We see Osiris's erection. Osiris has a, an erection. And the bird, the Africans want you to know that immaculate conception did not stop the use of the penis. And it did not stop a copulation between a male organ and a female organ. But now the point that we are caught with in the philosophical thinking of the African is in fact Osiris passes the sperm to the hawk. Did he pass it to a male hawk or 
to a female over and then. If the heart now passes the sperm to Isis, was it a female hawk or a male hawk? But the Africans had already given us the, the answer to that when they created the goddess Bess, a hermaphrodite. To know that, what is it? The law of opposite. We have the law of opposite in ourselves. Just stop. Take the man. Take the physical presentation of any man. I should say most men. <laughs> well, some of us. <laughs> some of us have, did have some operations that we had to go through. <laughs> but taking a man who had not passed the knife. <laughs> then you take the scrotum and take the phallus. Push it inside the man. And you've got a female. Pull what's in the woman out, and you've got a male. Just stop and think it over what the ovaries and the fallopian tube look like if you pull them out. Just pull them out, and you've got a man. Take the man, push him in. You've got a woman, and that's why they're made to copulate. It's a perfect fit. Right. I, I would say a tan. <laughs> Take it into consideration. <laughs> now, we should be able to understand this very clearly. That the Africans in perceiving virgin birth and immaculate conception saw the, the birth of human as being perfect. That's another thing. The African concept. You never hear an African say from an African religion, there is something wrong with the child by mere birth. The mere fact that the child was born, that that made the child, number one, the product of sin. And thus, because of that, the child would die. The African doesn't say that. The African, in his logic, in his intelligence, knows that anything died because of where? If there is birth, there must be death. The law of opposite says that we must die. It has nothing to do with anybody doing something wrong. The stars fall out the sky. The moons explode. There are different suns that explode. We have comets all over the place falling because planets disintegrate. Everything dies. Man too. Man is a product of nature and the African knew it. The African knew it from the mere fact of birth. There is death before birth. The umbilical cord dies, which sustained life before it came out. Life in heaven. The in keeping of the woman, there is your first heaven that you ever knew of when you were kept in that heaven. And that's why they ask women to be careful what you eat, be careful what you do while the child is in heaven. Of course, the doctor doesn't explain it that way, but it amounts to heaven. It is that place which you were, but you don't know. You have no recollection of it when you come out from this new world. When fresh air hits you, the whole thought processes that you had there changes into a different perspective that you can't even remember it. Of course, there is a little joke about that. It seems as if there were three psychiatrists who met at a convention with others, and they wanted to show how much their mind had developed. And so the one said, let's play a game of thinking back as far as we can go. And so the one says, I'll start. He says, I remember when I was three months old, my mother attempted to pin my diaper as a man, and uh, she wasn't too good at it. It was her first try. And she pinned both halves of my, you know, together. And made it very difficult for me. And the other one said, the other two said, no, we better give up. <laughs> if you can remember that far back. And then the other one said, oh, by the way, I just thought of something that is a little better than that. I remember the day I was born, and 
My father was so excited that he didn't realize that little babies like that, you don't throw them up, but he came and threw me up. And you know, the first duty that the little baby make looked like tar. And he was kind of light, but he, he didn't look tar after that. <laughs> the other one says, gee, boy, <laughs> there ain't nothing I could do. Gee, the day you were born. <laughs> Man, hell, what the hell did I do? So he said, oh, yes, I got it. He says, I remember going to Van Cortland Park with my father one day and came back with my de- mama the night. <laughs> You must admit that that brother got a good memory. (laughs) And so we continue. The concept of African philosophy then, bringing it down to a more, to the point as how it got over to the Greeks and what happened to it. What we have seen constantly is that the philosophical concept of the Africans which of course became the foundation for the theosophical concept, philosophy and theosophy. Theosophy, I mean philosophy, again, the attempt to explain the unexplainable within material by logic. Theosophy, the explanation of that philosophical concept of the unexplainable through logic by creating in that logic a positive force which states that that itself creates things. If I confuse you, let me see if I can confuse you a little further. Theosophy is stating that what we have conceived philosophically is in fact true. Thus God, thus must remain as the order of the day. It must control us as our moral concepts. That's what philosophy is as you could say, making out of philosophy, law, and order. The rule, the taboo, because it then states that the entity, the ultimate of all thought, called God, and it is there that the African introduced the concept of God is the word. And the word is God. The word of man, the word of thinking, is God. God is the Word. I am the I am. I am because I exist. I created myself. And that is the teaching that comes down from philosophy into what is theosophy. And thus the African says, God, Peter, made himself. He materialized himself from a non-matter. There was nothing and God, Peter, created himself out of the abyss of nothing, to which the Jews adopted, who came there later, reading these things on the walls that the Africans had already written, changing the concept from the goddess Hatha, the first deity that the Africans had already conceived, removing the, mask, the, 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 the femininity of the deity, removing it completely and upgrading the man to the point where the man now produces the first child and thus denoted the deity of the feminine part, the female, and since he must have something love opposite, he upgraded now the masculine to the role of the feminine. And thus, Adam gets the child out of his rib cage, but Eve gets the blame for sin. And that makes basically the difference of the African philosophical thought and the Judeo Christian Islamic philosophical thought. But all of them, you would find, deny. Islam, don't forget that a lot, A L apostrophe L A T, became a lot, A L. Apostrophe L A H. In other words, the H of the end of the word was changed for the T and made the difference between the male or the female. In the case of Christianity, Mary was denoted in order 
to make her son God. Again, the European withdrawing, removing the woman for the man. Mary is said still in Roman Catholic liturgy, particularly when we're speaking about the rosary. Holy Mary, Mother of God, blessed are the fruit of thy womb, of thy heaven, where man comes from, Jesus. In Judaism, we notice that there was an attempt to make men and women simultaneously without neither having a prestige over the other, and the God Jehovah says, let, no, the God Jehovah says, let us make man and woman, and send them out to multiply. It is, and that's the chapter one. It was not until chapter two that Jehovah created a man, and out of the rib of the man made a woman. Thus, the woman becomes dependent on the man for existence. The fear of allowing the woman to have, when we look at it, we can examine it, it is the tremendous fear of the power of childbearing that frightens the Judeo Christian Islamic writers. To frighten them, they could not produce offspring visibly. And at that time, did not understand the interrelationship between sperm, spermazola, and ova. They didn't understand. Therefore, could not. At the one time, they used to say that even conception was due to good or bad spirits. They didn't uh, relate. The sperm of a man, they didn't even know the sperm of a man. They understand the concept of it. But the African along the line, you see, understood. He understood very early in that. He understood because he used to go into the human body. It was not up to the 19th century. Uh, Dr. Anderson is here, he could delegate in medical history. Up until the 19th century, Europeans had to snatch bodies from graves. In order to go inside, it was outlawed. There was no autopsy. But the Africans who had been engaged in embalming, who had been engaged in mummification, knew from examination the internal operation of the human body. Yes, sir. Anyway, because they wrote extensively in different papyri on medicine, even on female diseases way back there. And thus, from an early stage, could understand the development of an offspring and the process which it went through, because it's, they saw the babies, the fetus, in various stages, and therefore were able to deal with it, write about it, teach about it, and conceptualize the relationship between men and women, and then understood the emotional value of the mother. The, the, the theosophical concept of the Africans were basically dealt with the emotional tradition of the African women, which we have not been able to deal with now. One of the biggest problems we have as men in this society is to go back to that concept and understand we are afraid of the relationship between mother and child. We want to know what it is, of what phenomenal thing, what mysterious thing, what hocus pocus goes on between the mother and the child. Why would my son fight me for his mother? Even if she hit me and I hit a black woman, fight me for his mother. Why? And I've treated him out here as good as she did. But we are still overlooking the umbilical cord, which the Africans early did not overlook in his philosophy. We realized that there was not only the umbilical cord, the umbilical cord is the physical aspect of something that developed in the chemistry from the day of implantation to the day of departure from the ovary. Yes, what happened in 10 months? Well, there is emotion going to the mother which the father doesn't have. You can have as much sympathy feelings as you want. <laughs> but he doesn't have that day-to-day -day feeling when it is the vomiting or the nausea or whatever it is. 
and some, some may not have that, but, but every other, the quickening of the baby moving around and so forth, the, the father may touch it and feel everything going on, but he doesn't feel it inside. He doesn't, he doesn't have that touch, that, that close feeling. And out of that, the African then said, a woman, we will rest. That's why she didn't have to pray. In most African religions, the woman doesn't have to pray. She, by virtue of the fact of childbearing, she relieves herself of the responsibility of having to pray because she has done God's bidding. She has forgiven the family. And that is it. Most African religion, the men go to pray. They don't even let the woman into the place of, of uh, worship so that they're not distracted. Because the woman is already exempted from this aspect of her life in that by virtue of her pregnancy, she had already done her praying. She had made her peace, so to speak, with her maker, if you want to put it in that sense. But now we have become Europeanized. We have become so Europeanized that we no longer recognize the temple of our own creation or the heaven of our own creation. And so we look for a heaven in the air someplace behind, behind the cloud. When in fact we were in heaven before we came in this world, we were in heaven. The first place we stopped was in heaven. Then we came out to hell. <laughs> But if we only go back and understand, let us understand the relationship between men and women, that sacred relationship, and then we will equally understand the concept of hell. And that's why I know there could not be any place where I'm going to be burning like a Willie Burger, and here's this, this God who has lost his cool, there, jumping up, watching me burn. And every time I cook, put the no cooking sauce on <laughs> so that I stop cooking and go back to where I was and cook me again forever and forever and forever. And then, you know, how many billions of people are going to be cooking? How much fire is that? You mean, there must be a lot of gas you have to uh, deal with. But anyhow, <laughs> it's, so, it's such a sad idea. How, what kind of a man conceive of this? But, <laughs> I mean, God must be mad. No, the first thing come up with that kind of story. God must be really angry. God hasn't spoken to that fellow in a long time. <laughs> to, to, to think that God will do that to his people. And then say that when the, a pot of hot water falls on the child, it is because of the sin of the parents of the child four generations before. Hmm? Now we have to look at the African and that. The sin of the, to the fourth generation. But the same God said, Suffer little children to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is a contradiction. God makes a distinction of the inability of a child to raise you as an adult in, this, in the one context. But the same God ignores the inability of the child. The lack of responsibility of the child for its action because it needs coaching, and then penalize the child for something that its grandparents, four generations removed, had done. It's difficult to understand, of course, but let us see if the Africans are, uh, uh, what is their number of sisters standing? Who knows, they may, we didn't see much pregnancy today. It could be she stood up so much she lost the baby. So what is it, you don't mind? And so, some of you know what a brother is. Uh, if you have doubt, what is it, give the sister, look, look closest to you and give that sister standing a seat. We, we are not, we are, this is not a matter of uh, what they call the word here, but chivalry. We are not being chivalry, we are being African. It's possible that there's some room upstairs. Is there, uh, is there some room upstairs also? It's possible for the brothers who want not to stand, I realize. But uh, 
Yes. Uh, very, thank you very much, brother. We don't seem to have any more sisters standing. Excuse me, Dr. Yes, sir. Are they small viewers? Is Bert small? The James small in the audience? The mini? No, Okay. He seems not to be here. All right. Now, as we start to come down to the crucial end of this thing, before the question and answer period, we have to then ask, what did the Africans do? Why is it that the African did not say? For the first commandment, thou shalt love thy God. No commandment, or even in the negative response, I have not refused to love thy God. Why isn't that the first law of order in the negative confession? The first law of order in the negative confession starts out, I have not made light thy buffer. I have not given you short way what you want to get your food. I have not cut short the cloth, the cloth that you want to get, that you purchase. Why is it that the first thing they said is deception? That they were interested in declaring that one shouldn't do. And any after his death, it goes up before the judgment God and is declaring that he had not violated this particular law. It is not the first law does not speak of the deity. The first law does not even speak of birth itself. The first law is speaking of deception. Why? According to the teaching of the, what is called the mystery system, this was placed first because the Africans knew that deception, one could be anything, one could stay and hold a gun, but the worst concept of this behavior, the African realized, is deception. I don't know what is going on when you're deceived. You know, your parents used to say, you can hide from a thief, but you can't hide from a liar. Remember that thing that the old folks used to say? At least I remember it. <laughs> I didn't have cookies to steal, but I stole a lot of things that Mama had and Daddy had, figuring that they didn't know. And I would get a whipping for that, but if I lied, and most of the time when I told the truth, I get the whipping anyway because the law was lying of love. The law didn't agree with my statement, it was a lie. But it was my father and my mother would whip me most for what they believed was a lie. They would whip me for normal bad things, but a lie, I got triple whipping. All kind of whipping for a lie. The whole family beat me for a lie. <laughs> because, as they said, we do not know if even if we should beat you, because we're lying. We don't know one way. They had the story there about the boy that always hollered wolf. Remember that one? These are all these stories are African stories. You see them in the Uncle Rima stories. They originally were the Boy Nancy stories. But again, we have we felt that we didn't have to leave, listen to those old folks. Because we say, well, what they knew? They were working by mother wit. They had no intelligence. They can't read and write. And we assume that reading and writing and all these things make intelligence. <laughs> it doesn't. It just means that you know symbols. <laughs> That's all it means. It doesn't mean intelligence at all. But with that context, the Africans came out and decried deception as the first rule of law because by deception they could do no immaculate conception. Oh, there's the reason for it. What is the deception? Let's go to deception, brother. Oh, darling, you look so good. <laughs> I could marry you. Sisters remember this. Most sisters remember this line. <laughs> Baby, what I'm going to do for you. <laughs> that's it, that's it. When he, when he said that, you look out. <laughs> He's going to do it to you. <laughs> If you only, the 
that you got to eat what? Man, you going to eat. What, what else am I going to do? I love you so much. I like you like hot love mud. <laughs> few months later, baby, I got a little thing to tell you. Yeah? I'm pregnant. For who? <laughs> Deception. And that pregnancy is no longer an immaculate conception. Because it was conceived in deception, thus removing the immaculate conception. It has nothing to do with that license from City Hall. <laughs> because that license, many of you are foolish enough to believe that that license means something. The man could just marry you just to get the body. Yes, sir. Huh? It happens too many places. He won't give up, and when he can get it, now he gets some money. Get it through off of the night. <laughs> Lucky if you stay the whole night, some guy just walk out when she snores. <laughs> <laughs> but that could, child could not be. With all the marriage certificate, with all the engagement, there is no, no, no immaculate conception to that relationship. But when the man says, I do care, I do feel, and then go through every one of those acts, and then care, and then take care of his child, and then take care of his woman, and even if his woman and himself break up because of what the situation, he still clings to his child, and do the responsibility as a man to his child, there was an immaculate conception, and there still is an immaculate conception, and a holy relationship. Is that a moon? Yeah. Okay. Is there a brown, someone has a brown Plymouth? Brown Plymouth. A, a valiant. But these concepts may sound strange because we have now started to feel guilty for being born. And not only this guilt for being born, but we start to feel guilty for our children and the guilt is never appeased. It is a total gift from the time of recognition of self to the time of death. We constantly feel that we have to pay off a debt for the thing which the God himself, herself, themselves, supposed to have created us to do. The guilt is so sad in that we cannot avoid the guilt if we become normal. This is the contradiction is that we are told, by virtue of childbirth, there is a sin. Yet, with our consciousness, we feel the need for doing what we have been prepared to do beyond our consciousness. We did not make ourselves. Our parents made us. And when our parents made us, if they were not the type of parents to understand that they too had an immaculate conception like Jesus, and Joseph and Mary. And we could notice that it must have been, they said that Mary, while riding the donkey, the ass, was the pain in child labor. What is it about Mary's child labor that is different to any one of you mothers' child labor? But we know. Why does she have any child labor? If it says, that the pain of birth shall be the penalty the woman pay for her sin, waiting with Adam. And if that is so, then what sin would Mary have for making the room? But having the sin too. A God's dot. We have to understand this. The Africans never once said that there was something sinful about the Africans by virtue of birth. 
since the African know that we are beyond the ability of control in terms of birth. It is a function that nature itself, God, placed on us. The highest force is the family. And that is the process by which the family comes. And if it was no birth, there would be no people. And if then birth itself is sinful, then God wants to sin. And the law of opposite explains it, that man's behavior, man, is capable of all emotion that man, the generic sense, male and female, are capable, and men will at always, at various times, use those emotions. <clears throat> How many times did you feel like killing someone? What stops you is your culture, your national, your philosophy, and your philosophy. Because you have come together in a compact group, and you have decided among yourself, killing is bad. That's the only reason you don't go out and kill randomly. Because you have agreed, not because you don't have the feelings and the emotion and the capability to do it. But the African came together and said, after having come in this world, then it is better for all of us to be save each other's life rather than to destroy it, because the more we have, the better we can plan. And so the emotion to kill, which is the opposite of the emotion to save, but is equally as good. Killing is as good an emotion as saving life. Because it's equal, the opposite, but the convenience of our society. The Africans then say, philosophically, although killing is no worse or better emotion than saving, it dislodges from the community that benefit of relationship, social relationship. And thus, we will not kill. Not because it is bad. Because the rain comes is no better than the sun coming. The rain for the farmer is good. For the city dweller, it may be the flood. The snow. This morning I was in New Paltz getting ready to come down here, and it started to snow. And I started to get out the snow as fast as I could to get down to the bus station to make sure I could get the earliest bus to escape the snowfall. But the children were out with their little sled. Glad the snow was coming. And it could have, if, I, if they could read my thoughts, they'd have killed me. <laughs> <laughs> See? Right there, the law of opposite was working. They wanted the snow so they could slay. I wanted the snow to stop so my bus wouldn't get stuck. And I'd get out that place so I could be here. So it was the equal phenomena that all things have equal value. Right. But what happened is that we as human beings, for our benefit, since we are pains, non-bearing, and pleasure-seeking, we do not want pain. Although pain is the be beginning of our existence. Pain is the beginning of our existence. <laughs> Most women have pain when they're losing their hymen. And in order to get us, that pain created our existence. It is a pain which mothers told me, I have never had the experience, but I've been told by mothers that the pain of childbirth quickly goes away upon the presentation of the child. And most mothers say, I can't explain it to you. It, it, it's, like, it's like, you know, you know, but I can't. She can explain it to another woman who has been a mother. She can explain it to another woman who has not been a mother. Not this for a man. But it must be another woman who has been a mother and who has given birth to at least experience, experience childbirth pain. And this is what is the African view. And in this context, he said, you are top shelf. You are the source of the race. You must be delicate, delicately handled and protected. You, a wall, must be built around. You must be protected at all times. For you 
is the creator of the race. You are the mother of us all. Thus, the black woman, the African maid, the symbol, the... This month, she cannot get pregnant again this month. She can't get pregnant again seven months, eight months, nine months. And so he said, but pregnancy may equally harm you, so I give you a rest of two years. <coughs> Most of us in our society don't want to give you even 30 days. <laughs> And thus, thus, because he didn't give her 30 days, she didn't get an opportunity to have another immaculate conception. <coughs> you could understand why he then developed polygamy, among other reasons. The last three minutes. I know that you have heard a story, and I'm going to end with it. Some of you have heard it. But because I dedicated this lecture to our senior elder in the field, I don't think there are too many elders older than John Clark in the field, probably Chancellor Williams, and yes, not probably Chancellor, and Alonzo uh, Green, John Jackson, but there aren't too many. There aren't too many of us past the 60s, 70s, 80s. And I would say that I in a sense will extend the dedication, not only to Professor Clark, whose it is to, but to add the others of that age group. And I'm sure that Professor Clark wouldn't mind me extending that to the woman of his life, his wife, the mother of his two children, which I can extend also to all of the mothers here. That's not putting down those of you who are not mothers. There, there are times that the law of opposite, sins do happen that way. A woman isn't less a woman solely because she was never pregnant or had never given birth to a child. Childbearing is a lucky chance. There's a lot of luck to it. It's not necessarily her fault. It's not a fault question. It is not necessarily something that happened on her side. It could have been that the male she mated with and her didn't just match together. Or it could be that he can't produce an offspring. You never know unless there's some test go on. But I want to reiterate, if I did not before, Professor John Hendricks Clark had a mother. And so my dedication must extend to his mother in particular. And so I extend this, the sole basis for my philosophy being that John Clark's mother and the other mothers of African people. For if she had not been kind enough to maintain what she had received from John Clark's father, John Clark may never have been, and we would never have had the privilege of a John Clark. Right. And that would have been a tragedy. So I will extend my, my dedication to John Clark's mother and use another woman in this case as the symbol of the Clark mothers among us. Some of you may have heard it, but I need to repeat it. Based upon what I've been seeing in traveling with young brothers who feel that young sisters are destroying black brothers. It is, it burns me up to hear the negativity on these campuses of young brothers' attitude about young sisters is all in defense of their mating with white women. <laughs> it would seem, it's, the, the story goes, and I'm going to cut it short, that there was the prettiest woman on this block just like all of you sisters. You know, it's a hell of a thing. I think that a black man should never get married. <laughs> and I know that you sitting right there. <laughs> How the hell you could be conscious enough with all these pretty women to decide to marry one? <laughs> the 
mean, you, you really got to be off the mind. That's like when I decided to marry, I was off my mind. <laughs> And all the competition she had, you know what I mean? <laughs> That's why I said to her, don't worry about it, you're not going to give up and bring back a step on me to you. <laughs> but it was seen that the most beautiful woman in the block, and it's up to a man's eye to decide which one is the most beautiful. And everybody was running after this sister, everybody who was somebody. All the brothers with money and food in there who were jumping over LaGuardia uh, with a hearse bag. In the <laughs> they didn't leave yet. They were still home. <laughs> they still had their mind. They didn't go out yet and so forth. Well, growth sometimes happens when we get too long and our sense go out and so forth. We don't, when we throw basketball, we say, I didn't know how good a sex was and life was until I get this thing like groupie. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like that. See, even those were looking at the time. And so this little brother, like myself, he was so ugly that Sin turned around and ran from him. <laughs> Nevertheless, in spite of his ugliness, he still knew that he had to get tightened up. <laughs> so he too figured he could challenge this pretty young lady, this beautiful thing there, yes, like all of you girls. And so he said, look, baby, can I get into this thing? I mean, the thing of asking her the question. <laughs> and she said, but no, I'll be like you, I'll be in hell. <laughs> Man, look, things ain't that bad yet. <laughs> she said, but I love you. They only want to use you. She said, no, no, I'm not in hell. He said, by the way, okay, I'll tell you what. If you want me so bad, and you ain't got nothing, you're ugly, everything, <laughs> then go down to the local police station and slap the surgeon. That's the right surgeon there. And come back. And if you do it, I marry you. Three months later. <laughs> you better walk up. Have you ever seen the invisible man? He had no bandage around his head. He had two little holes for him to see here. And a little, one little hole here. And a little tiny little hole. And she said, what do you think? What happened? He said, <laughs> I like to translate for him, he said, he didn't only slap the surgeon, he slapped the right captain. <laughs> and the patient caved in on his head. <laughs> but he says, now I'm getting spent again and I still want to know, I noticed that you're not married. And she says, please stop bothering me. She says, leave me alone. So she figured she'd give me something that he possibly couldn't do. She said, now look, okay, since you're bothering me, you will go. I believe you're serious, but still. He says, now take this knife and go and cut your mother's heart out and bring it to me. Well, if you do that, you got me. He said, but that's my mother. I can't do that. I know I'm ugly and all that, but that's my mother. She says, look, you want me? <laughs> he said, yeah, and he got down his knee, you know what we do. You know how you fellas do it. He got down his knee. He got lower than a grasshopper. And he was low. He was low. He crawled underneath that snake belly. That's how low he got. And he says, yeah, baby, I'll do anything. What do that, that? She says, look, that's the final. Your mother's heart or nothing. The brother sit there and said, damn. <laughs> Mama done had her fun. <laughs> Plus, look what she did to me. <laughs> I think I may have to give it a chance. <laughs> so the brother walked, didn't want to, really didn't want to hurt Mama. And so he went and he sharpened the knife. And he sharpened it so badly pull out one of these long hair like mine, and he cut it down, straight down, four ways. <laughs> he said that wasn't sharp enough, so he sharpened it a little. And then he chipped over, running down to the house, and he ran into the house, and mommy was lying flat on her back, taking a little snooze. And she said, Charlie, you see, all black people, and all black people, and Charlie, watch me tell the John. Right, John? <laughs> <laughs> now, so he run into the house and the mama says, John, what you doing back there, boy? He said, but mama, you, you sleep on how the hell you watch me? She says, son, I got 14 kids and I know the footstep, I know the crawl, I know the doll, I know the, the smell, I know my children. Each of you got a separate thing. 
said, well, oh, she, she just said that by guess. I have no way, he says, because she wanted me to figure that I, I ain't going to hurt her. So he went in the kitchen and said, damn, if she knew that much, I better make it a little bit sharper. <laughs> he sharpened again and sharp again. And he just tried to catch the dog, one of them fine little dogs, and he cut that down four ways. Again. He, he cut the top of the wrench to make sure it was sharp. <laughs> so he edged him, creeped him, and he creeped him. And Mama was lying back there snoring again, knowing that she's safe because of her son is home. And he runs the knife down with Mama. And he turned it around. And he got the heart, nice warm, jumping up. And started to run through the door, going to give his girlfriend the heart so he could get her. Just then he forgot that there used to be a stone by the blind that kept the mosquitoes out. And he tripped in the stool. It was late in the evening. The sun had gone down. We couldn't see the heart. And he started to crawl. To find his heart and he looking and nothing. <coughs> then he noticed that his knees were busted up because it had hit the pavement so hard. And just then his hand felt this soft thing. It was the heart. It was bleeding. And he said, I said, I gotcha. I'm going to give you to my woman. And just then the heart cried out. Did you hurt yourself, my son? No. That's the black woman. She cries out to the black man. Did you hurt yourself, my son? <laughs> Into the question and answer period and the announcement, we'll ask Dr. Clark if he'd like to say a few words to us today. Dr. Clark? I want to thank Dr. Ben. I want to call your attention to the school, the Tuesday night school, and the Wednesday night school. This is a special school and a special way of teaching. It's not the standard academic way of teaching. And you can call it unorthodox if you want to. You'd probably be right. But it is in that unorthodox way we try to cut through all the mythology and bring the truth. And as it will be starting again uh, next week, both of us would appreciate if you make the arrangement to be at one or the other class or at both of the, the classes. It is meaningful to me because it would be professionally my return to activity after the uh, sojourning in the hospital and the long sojourning at home and getting back uh, to teaching at least in a small way before going back to the college in the in the fall. And I'd like to say again how much both of us appreciate the supportive service that you have given to both of us. I think uh, being called elders and coming repeatedly before you, I think this is the highest point in the lives of both of us. There is a revolution in information about African people. And that revolution is moving faster than you have been able to absorb it. Because things are happening, even those who distorted your history is repudiating their own distortion. Last year, a satellite flew over what is now called the Sahara Desert. Now that's a contradiction, because if you say the Sahara Desert, you're saying desert, desert, because the word Sahara means desert. But the Europeans don't hear very well or learn very fast. 
sometime and misnamed most of the world, including some of the desert. But that's not the point. The point is that they discovered through scientific instruments that under that sand there was a civilization 200,000 years ago. Now, it is the role of the teacher to ask the right questions and get the right answer. 200,000 years ago, Europe was an ice cap. Mainland Asia had not communicated with the, with, with, uh, with the African people. There were no Arabs in the world and there were no Jews in the world at the time. Who built that civilization that had high technology now covered by a sand? So you are not revising history and I unfortunately heard one of our historians say that those of us who are trying to restore so many things African are revisionalists. We are not revisionists. It is the Europeans who in the 15th and the 16th century revised history to flatter themselves at the expense of the world. We are correctionalists. <laughs> We are trying to correct history to show it in, a, in its proper light. In our claim on the world, we are not claiming any part of Europe or Asia, but we are claiming all of the turf, all of the land, all of the islands in the world that belong to us by right. We are also claiming those islands populated mainly by Africans whose economy was brought into being by African labor. That does not mean that we would give up one inch of the Caribbean islands. Our labor, our sweat, and our tears have made these things mine and made them ours. And I think we must begin some broad thinking. And we must think beyond the concept of Pan-Africanism and think of the concept of a, of a world union of African people. If you imagine a world union of African people stretching through the Pacific, stretching through parts of mainland Asia, and I'm talking about only those areas where an African population is predominant, whose economy was brought into being by our sweat and our tears in the death of our mothers and our fathers. And I am saying more than ever, since the unfortunate attack on me coming from the American left, I have thought this situation out. And I have decided that maybe I violated one of my own rules. I have taught students repeatedly that when an oppressed person, a person from an oppressed people, tells his people the true nature of power, he's either assassinated driven into exile or killed outright. And we have to understand that people who teach broadly and tell our people the true nature of power and the truth about themselves and expose the hand of other people need more than just support. They need protection. <laughs> to acknowledge the fact that he used his influence at that hospital in Harlem that physically is a good hospital, it's well staffed, but people don't do for you what needs to be done for you unless you got a little clout to make them do it. Dr. Anderson used his clout to make sure that the best in therapy that's supposed to come to a human being was given to me when I went to that hospital and I do want to show my appreciation for the service of this brother because if you go over there, if you don't throw your weight around, sometimes you have to just wait there. Right. But if you go over there, say, so Dr. Anderson said, do this for me. Dr. Vaughn here said that when I come here, I don't suppose to be waiting. Right. Then 
they get on their silk and do their job right. And I want to say that it means something. We should have a whole network of brothers telling other brothers when that brother arrives, give him the treatment he deserves. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. concept of uh, birth after death, the rebirth or resurrection, is one in which the African is expressing his belief. Uh, he has become elaborate in terms of the life after death. Remember that the African doesn't promise that when you die, you're going to come back in this world looking like you look. So that's one thing he doesn't. Uh, that is one thing that uh, Judeo Christianity and Islam has carried beyond after picking up that the African was speaking about life after death, that African made it specific, if you look in the Book of the Dead, that when any comes back to life, it's not a life on this earth. It is a life in another world, another type of life, uh, a, a, a resurrection into another type of life. That, that, uh, and they made it clear to show that he regains with the color of life, but down to the bottom of his foot still remain the color of death. Meaning that the life that they're talking about could be a life in death. It does, you see, when we talk about resurrection, most of us from the Judeo-Christian Islamic thing talking about coming back like you were someplace else. They don't promise that. They said, you will come back in another life in death. The another perspective is another life. When you're dead, if you're right, you live in another life. Because they said, uh, the whole context could be said in terms of a tree. When the tree dies, it falls, generally, after a while, and it now starts to disintegrate. But it creates manure, it creates a, a, a fertilizer, with something else grow because of its death. So that's life after death. Doesn't promise what most people want, is they want that they can live another life. I said live good now, live, do the things you want to do now. Don't wait till you die, or you may never get a chance. show you a forbidden fruit. Right. You could carry somebody and them, show them a pear, a peach, or a plum, you know, uh, any of those fruits you could get in almost any market. But you can't find a market with a forbidden fruit. Not only the market, you can't find a field where you could go and anybody 
the Pope, the rabbi, and everybody could say you have forbidden fruit. So that, obviously, that is a moral symbol. It, it's just like the Adam and Eve thing. It's, it's, it's a story, it's an allegory, and more different than many other allegories. And what, was un, what is unfortunate is that most people take it to be a literal fact. And I don't think any rabbi in his right mind will tell you that that was a literal fact. He'll tell you it's a moral story. And so when you talk about the forbidden, uh, I, I can remember that when my mother spoke to me about the forbidden fruit at the time, she changed as I grew and as she felt that I understood more. The forbidden fruit story had different turns as she was speaking about it and eventually she stopped speaking about it. It's like Santa Claus. I was never given a Santa Claus because my father said that he doesn't really look like hell to get some money and then give the credit to some man from the white folks. I mean, not told. So I never had a Santa Claus to, uh, told to me. But I did have the forbidden fruit. And then finally my mother said it was a means by which I would learn to understand, to respect women. That the forbidden fruit was in fact, I was forbidden from interfering with a young girl not understanding what I was doing. And that's what she meant by the forbidden fruit. It was a means by which to establish in me some moral value in which I wasn't going to move a woman just for the sake of moving her. She felt that I had to develop the sense of understanding that a young woman was not a piece of garbage, it was not a slap tail. And the way in which to, to accomplish that was to talk about the forbidden fruit. So it was a moral story to her. I don't know of an African society, the villages, because many of the cities, the African, they have adopted Western values. I think that Dr. Nkrumah's state showed us this. One of the problems that Kuma had with the Supreme Court was that he could not kill his enemies. He just couldn't. The culture which he came up under did never saw if a man in the community killed another person. They made him support the children of that family for the rest until they grew to adult. They made him do different things of that nature. But not a single African society I knew put a man to death because he had killed somebody. They made him support the family or contribute to that. He had obligations for a long time towards any children that were left, and so on and so on. But I, I can't think of a single African society that wasn't imposed upon by European society where a debt penalty was legal. Can't think of any. So it, 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 that was the way in freedom. It didn't say because there were some cases when a man would cut off the handle and do that, but there was never a, the, the thing of reprisal because African society does not say that the state had the right to kill, but not the individual. This is the, the, the irony and the tragedy and the hypocrisy in Western society is that the state reserved the right to kill, but said that the individual can't kill when the state is not but a collective, supposed to be a collective aspect of, uh, of the society. Because, I mean, killing doesn't become good or bad because the state is going to do it. It's like saying, we have a law that if you kill a policeman, then you have to be electrocuted. What difference the policeman and my son? Who's not a policeman? I mean, if you kill my son, nothing happens. What is he? You've got to be a policeman to get electrocuted, or be the president to get electrocuted, or something like that. I mean, that's ridiculous. If you kill, if you're going to kill people for killing people, then it should be whether the policeman or not. But it is a Western myth. It is some people are dispensable in Western psychology, and some are not. Well, that's my question. I'm not going to go to the front and stuff. I wasn't asking specifically about what the penalty for someone who has killed, but how do the people manage for the most part not to kill anybody? Culture. The society, when your society is just like. How you would feel if you were, most of us here are brought up on a, a polygamous 
and, and monogamous philosophy, although that doesn't happen re, uh, in terms of the men. But we have a moral guilt about it when we do not behave in that way, because we have been trained that way, been conditioned that way. Now, when you're born in an African society, you're conditioned from a child. You are conditioned in certain behavior patterns. And you feel it. It's just like uh, the, in some society it used to be that um, a person who committed a theft would go through a certain amount of rituals. And they were taught that if you were innocent and you could put your hand in a pot of boiling water and it would do you no harm. So what they used to do is if somebody thefts, stole something and they were charged with it, they would go through a ritual and say, okay, now you put your hand in this boiling water. And if a person knew that he didn't do it, the way he was brought up, he knew that that wouldn't burn him. So he started putting his hand in it and grabbed him and said, no, you're innocent. And the person who knew he was guilty, because of the psychological way in which he was brought up, he would do like this and then he stuck over back because he said, he knows it's going to burn him. He was taught, he was psycho <laughs> psychologized to do that. So it, 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 think you were that way. Not because you're trying it out. And that's the whole reason you're, you're programmed. In every society, people are programmed. Mm -hmm. and, and in that society, you're, pro the, you're programmed not to commit a murder because so and so will happen. You're programmed not to do this because the yams will go bad. And you don't want the yams to go bad, how are you going to eat? And all, it's, you program it, like a couple of dogs. All society program its people. They don't have any such syndrome. Uh, they don't feel that a child has any sin by birth. There's nothing defective about the child mentally by virtue of birth solely because of the penalty that their parents or grandparents suffer for merely having sexual intercourse. Now, that's not at all in any African society that I know of where any such thing is taught that there is a penalty for being born and that penalty is solely the process of birth. I don't know of a single African society which that comes in. To the contrary, African society so revere birth that it is the, one of the most precious things could ever happen. Uh, in an African family, when two families get married, the, the marriage of a man and a woman isn't the marriage of two people. It is the marriage of at least two families. Right. Now, it then becomes the marriage of the village. And, and in the rituals of the marriage, there is generally rice or something of its nature that swells. And one of the symbols of the, the marriage is the rice. And, and you know what happened to rice when you got one cup and then you put it in hot water? It swells, right? And uh, the first thing an African marriage has in it is the blessing for children. It's always the blessings for children. I mean, that's one of the elaborate things is for children. As, as you see the, the First World Alliance in, in its cradle, cradle as before we start going into anything, the first thing is the recognition of the elders. They're going out, they're, they've been in, they came in as children, they are, became adults, and they're now going out as older people. Some of us even symbolically grow up like we were children because of inability to function uh, fit as strong as we used to. But again, the, the, the last thing, the first thing you see being recognized are the elders. The last thing is the new people to come, the babies in the mother's womb, the people to come. So in the African philosophy, the youth, the youngest and the oldest are one. They're at the point of crossroad. One starts where the other one ends. And so there's a complete circle. And the African never sees the child other than the product of God. And as that product of God being God itself, the manifestation of God is the child. Uh, it is wisely said about Africans that the most beautiful time of a woman is when she's pregnant. Western uh, falsity about beauty is that a woman is obvious because 
She's out of shape, they said. She's not out of shape. You can't be pregnant flat. <laughs> so you, if you're pregnant, you can't be out of shape big. You're in shape because you're pregnant. Right. Now, if you're out of shape and you don't have none, then check with the doctor because you might have lost it. Now, so you can't be out of shape. You're in shape for pregnancy. But in the African concept, my concept, that a woman is most beautiful when she's pregnant. And the more advanced she becomes pregnant, the more beautiful she looks. See, I'm not looking necessarily at the fact that she doesn't wear size 10 or 12 or, or 6 anymore. I am looking at a beauty of a life within a life. And there's beauty there. I, I, I've been the father name a few times. And to touch, to touch, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing to be able to touch a woman's stomach and then see the baby move away, the equipment as it's called, and feel that touch. Now, I know the mother must have a hell of a sensation, uh, which I will never know. That's one of the things that brothers and angry father will never know. And, but the ability to have, to have the privilege of feeling and seeing is a beauty all in itself, because I have the privilege of dealing with a life that I haven't seen, but know it's a life there. Feeling the result of it. And then one day see it. And being able to hold it now. It's a, it's a beauty there that, that, the, uh, that transcends the thing that the eye said is that, um, that type of beauty. So beauty is expressed in so many ways. I'm speaking about beauty, which is in the, which is a mental beauty, rather than just a, a visual beauty that registers in the back. I'm talking about that mental concept of beauty, because life is beautiful. Now, death is beautiful, too. When my mother had gotten so ill, my mother was a very light woman in, in complexion. And when she died, she was darker than that, that radio. She had gotten the illness in a shot. She got sick on November the 8th. I think it was by January she was dead. But she, so many, something came down on her. Well, when I went and saw my mother, I wouldn't go into the details and so forth. I, I was glad my mother died. It was the most beautiful thing when my mother died. You see, get what I'm saying now? Because the, the way I saw my mother as against the way I knew my mother, it was like night and day. I didn't want to see my mother like she was, and she didn't want to be like she was. So the best thing that happened to her at that point was to return to where she had come from, that other world which I don't know. And I felt that maybe something there is, was better than the condition that she was in here. Knowing the woman, knowing this was a woman that put on the best of clothes and, you know, enjoyed life and, and uh, had an air of, uh, air of, of real life. And to see her there in the bed, that when I went, my friend, Dr. James, uh, that I grew up with, took a scissors and pushed it right through my mother's, right above her knee. She didn't flinch because there was no feeling there. She had died all the way up here. It was just waiting for the poison to hit the heart. And her face was twisted so that there was a beauty in her death. The beauty was the relief of pain, the relief of the family to go back to close, close and close, what we would call normal life. And then to feel in ourselves, she was relieved. That was a beauty. You get what I'm trying to say now. Beauty used in the context of right different. We always think of beauty as a face that is a pleasing to certain of us. But the beauty in all kinds of things, it all depends on the relationship of the thing to you. That beauty could be said. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, well, it was training. Again, it comes from how you train the child. From when you, when you, 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 you have behavior, you are taught that your behavior damages the entire people, group, the entire tribe. That you now know that you're not an individual out there like you say, I'm doing my thing, man. I don't care about nobody, I'm doing my thing. I got a radio going two million decibels, and it doesn't matter that you got a bad ear. Doesn't matter, I'm doing my thing. <laughs> You said, man, well, can you turn the radio down? <laughs> no, I like it this way. <laughs> you see now, 
uh, the African child is told, you are the result of two people automatically. Number one, directly, mother and daddy. You are the result of other mothers and daddies. Put them together, you've got a whole series of people. Then, your mother and daddy, when they're born, met other people in this world sharing the common space. Now, when they share that common space, some, and you claim you aren't here, somebody's got to move so you can have some of that space. So if you know on other people's space, if they give the space to you, then you in turn must realize that for the space you have been given to use, you don't have to compensate for that space by doing things to make it easy so that people who have given space to you, that that space you occupy will give them a chance in less space to operate as good. Now, so that you occupy space belonging to everyone. So you are a part of the society. If, in fact, you lie down in the street, people that at least walk over, you have disturbed the whole community because they at least have to move their foot to step over you, which they didn't have to do before. So you, what your very act, your every act affects the entire society, not just yourself. And as such, then, you are interrelated to behave in that society with the laws and rules and regulations which make it comfortable for you as well as everybody else. So you can't say, you, I'm an individual to help with everybody else. Because if that was so, they should have made yourself. Right. Uh, Dr. Ben, before I leave, I would just like you to clarify one point that you made, and that was about uh, academic. Um, the point about him being trusted by uh, Adam, you mentioned that point before. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Akhenaten, as, as well as others, spoke of the atom. Uh, the god Aten that he worked with was a whole different thing. The at, at or M is the, dealing with the physical property of things, the thing, the thing which all of us are composed of. And Aten, A-T-E-N, is the concept of the deity, that which was responsible for all things, including the atom, which is a very heavy concept because when we're talking about the deity, we presuppose that there is that, that whatever that causes everything to be, including uh, whatever, the atom too. And it's the all-encompassing entity, or entities. We do not, many of us assume to know the ultimate answer. I do not know the ultimate answer because I too am examining belief. One thing the mystery system state that a man reached the final degree when he dies, because then he knows the ultimate. No one can know the ultimate answer until he's reached to the ultimate stage. And the ultimate stage of all knowledge is death. There's no, nothing else you can know. Because we have gone through all the stages that we know. From the beginning of life, to life, to death. You've done the complete circle. And we said the only thing else to do after, the only thing you could do when you're born is to die. Uh, we have a young doctor here. She, you start dying from the day you're born. You come out and you got some stool, you get rid of that, right? An umbilical cord gone. Parts of you start dropping off already. <laughs> <laughs> and as you build new cells, all of them start dropping. And then eventually you don't build any new ones and they just start dropping like flies. Boom, boom, boom. And when anyone to drop, you croak. <laughs> and the undertaker get happy. So it is, it, 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 of course, if we could understand this, that is why some of us don't struggle because we expect life to be forever. Some of us recognize that we're not going to live forever, so what we do is decide to take a stand because we know that someday we're going to die. Nobody's willfully saying, I want to die in his, I mean, what we call in his right mind. But at the same time, we make the decision that death would be better. The death, the physical death that we know would be better than the living death. What I mean by that, it, it would be better for somebody riddling me with bullets and then I fall out and the undertaker get the job than to be dead mentally where I have to use drugs to cover what I'm ashamed of. You get what I'm saying? So, uh, that's what Professor Clark got up and said today, just this afternoon, is that he had to make a decision between the so-called friends who would exterminate him, physically or elsewhere, if he doesn't be their boy. 
if he doesn't allow them to manipulate them, him, as they once thought they did what he may have allowed them to do. And he says, it comes to the point where I'm now saying, he says he had forgotten what his mother had taught him. Go back to that mother again. But now he says, I'm sure his mother is dead, he's now saying, the old time religion, you know what I mean? I'm using the term, what mama taught me is the old time religion. I don't mean Mama says saying about old time religion is old time behavior, old time morality, old time law. And Mama said, you cannot give up yourself at no time. To anyone, you must maintain your integrity above all. He says, I'm doing it. And he doesn't care now. I mean, it doesn't mean those exact words, but it's in the sense that there is an integrity. And, and then he says, there was something that happened to us that wasn't happening. And we had forgotten it, like I do, or some of us, that we once were we once were a family. And we were a family that was supported. And he said that he saw by his experience in the hospital what he had not seen for years. African supportiveness of each other. The extended family. He said his wife and him were glad because I, I knew it, that every minute of the day, if he wanted, there would have been somebody there to cut up his food, to kill a sheep. Tell me they didn't have to be nurses there. If they, if they didn't want to go, if the nurses were on strike, he wouldn't have felt any difference. Because there were people there every minute of the day that he wanted someone. So he said, behind that, no reason, with that African supported this, there's no reason why he doesn't have to take any nonsense from, from that group. Because we need the support. That's another thing that he said. That we not only need the support, but we need the protection. Because it gets to the point where, and it's true, people don't understand the words that power. And it is a fact that the, the written word will make you kill somebody. Well, when you, the, the, we didn't see physical slavery for the most part. We see the result of it. But when we read physical slavery, some of it, we boil up inside. The words create action. And, and uh, uh, we, those of us who say, look, take the blind off your face. Open your eyes and hear. You, now, one day you walk up and you believed that something was wrong with you because it was the original sin. Your mother had you in sin and something's wrong. And one day, somebody come and tell you, no, no. Hey, you like that. You open your eye and now, for the first moment you come, after 10, 20 years, and you say, hey, now what is wrong with me? Your behavior is bound to change. If your mindset changes, your behavior changes. And now you're free of this. You're going to see your child in a different light. You're going to see your mother in a different light. You're going to see your woman in a different light. Therefore, there's going to be a whole, that's, that's where the Christian should mean, I was born again. A new life. But not in your physical life. You still can't go there and walk start up in front of a car going 80 miles an hour because you're born again. <laughs> and you're going to stop. <laughs> 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 